claim, uh, basically popular claim, uh, by the local church in a diocese. And what they look for is signs of heroic, heroic virtue. A dossier is uh, completed, sent to Rome, and uh, after a, a process, uh, a consultative process on the local level, they are sent to Rome, and uh, if it passes uh, all the pro steps in the process at Rome through the department in Rome is called the Congregation for the Causes of the Saints. Causes of the Saints. They are first declared venerable. Okay. Uh, and so there's a formal recognition. Uh, and then they, uh, it's encouraged for them uh, that there's, there can be wider than just on the diocesan level of appreciating these people, or, you know, uh, you know uh, honoring them, holding their uh, life of heroic virtue up as examples for people. Uh, if there's a, enough verification then, then, uh, they are beatified, and it, there's a similar process. They are called beati, or in English, blessed at this time. And usually, one of the things, through their inter intercession, they look for verification of one miracle. That's not the sole criteria, but that is one of them. And if they are declared beate, then the encouragement of their intercession or prayer for them to intercede it is extended more widely. Uh, and uh, if there is an indication after this step that there is a second miracle, then again it goes through the process in the Vatican, uh, several different steps, uh, and verification of that second miracle and then there's the, the formal uh, canonization at which they are called a saint. And given either where, where they came from or given uh, what are elements of their heroic virtue, uh, they would be uh, identified as patrons of such and such. Yeah? Father, question. If you're looking at miracle in the sense of the 20th century, and we're into um, uh, the readings now from Acts of the Apostles, the miracles that were performed, how do we define the miracles in the 20th century of these two men? Uh, well, the definition of miracle. Well, it, it, miracles uh, today, of course, uh, with our uh, scientific uh, uh, medical investigations and so on, uh, miracles would have to be, uh, you know, usually extremely, uh, you know, serious illness uh, that. Uh, doctors say there, there's virtually no hope and so on, uh, that all of a sudden, because of the prayers and intercession, you know, uh, attributed to this person, all of a sudden, there's, it's gone, okay? But there certainly has to be medical verification of that, yeah. But on the other side, couldn't that, the fact that, let's just say Pope John, uh, what he had done to bring a whole church along in a whole different uh, direction, in a whole different understanding, isn't that more as much a miracle as some physical uh, manifestation? 
Well, it's interesting. I I was hopefully going to conclude with that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because, because, you know, you, you probably heard reports that, uh, you know, the, there wasn't a second miracle verified for, and usually it's it, John Paul II, which is wrong, which is wrong. There was a second miracle uh, uh, attributed to the intercession of St. John Paul II. There is only one verified miracle to John the 23rd. Okay? So, uh, the, the, the uh, decree, and after each of these steps, there has to be, well, this, leading to this step and this step, there has to be a formal decree on the, uh, by the Pope, given the results of the in investigation, and there's two or three steps in Rome that they investigate uh, the cause, uh, formal decree by the Pope that they are beatified, and then the final one that they are uh, declared saints. It was Pope Francis who said exactly what you're hinting at, that Pope John XXIII because of his uh, calling the Second Vatican Council in the, in the process <coughs> and the effect that that had on the Roman Catholic Church in the modern world, that that is close enough to a second miracle. Okay? Uh, Jim? Okay? All right. So... Uh, so now you can go from the back to the beginning. Yeah. Well, but here, here's the thing. I think uh, pretty much everyone in this room has a living memory of these two new saints, which is really quite extraordinary. So I want you to take a little time at your tables to share with one another what you remember just of John the 23rd, of Pope John the 23rd. Go. I'll give you four and a half minutes.
something a little bit different today, uh, looking at saints, and uh, you probably heard all kinds of uh, uh, interesting things from the living memory that's in this group. So, uh, uh, who wants to share, not your memory, but something that you heard from someone at your table that you said, I didn't know that. <laughs> yes? Well, I just, I just saw the movie of um, um, John... Uh, John, then, uh, um, you just 23rd, saw a movie of, of John the Twenty Third. Yes. And um, in there, it showed that he had saved six hundred children, Jewish children, from extermination. I had never heard that before. Okay, that he he had saved six hundred Jewish children from extermination. Yes. Uh, all right. In a movie that uh, she saw recently. What else did you hear? Yes, Richard. Uh, no, I heard it from you that uh, uh, Vatican II that we considered a miracle. Then is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Pat said he was like you, a Darbonian. He was a farm boy. He was a, a farm boy. Well, his his family were uh, sharecroppers, and even though they came, the family origins. They were not a high noble family, like the Pope before him, Pope Pius XII, Pacelli. Uh, he came from a very aristocratic Italian noble family. His family, uh, uh, Roncalli's family, uh, had some nobility in it, but it was like second and third tier nobility. So uh, his family was... Uh, uh, they were sharecroppers, as were most of the people in the village that he came from. There was 14 in his family. He was the fourth born, but the oldest son. Yeah, okay. What else did you... Yeah, Franklin. Well, I thought that uh, in 63, after the Holocaust, and I'm not sure about this, this is kind of when the start changes from the Latin into the lo local vernacular uh, as a result of that. Some of those changes are was that a thing to say. Well I, I thought it was during that time because that's when I graduated from high school. So yeah. I remember What's, being an older boy and then yeah. you know, we switched What's interesting, and, and you may vaguely remember this, I vaguely remember this, so uh, even before the start of the Second Vatican Council, 
which uh, <clears throat> brought about uh, and, and said the encouragement of use of the vernacular, the, con the language of the country, rather than Latin, uh, in the liturgy. He introduced some liturgical reforms before that. Okay? And, yeah, even before the council. And I don't know if you, if, if you folks remember, but, uh, but uh, before the council, we had in our pews uh, 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 sheets or cards that people were encouraged to respond along with the servers to the prayers of the Mass, even in Latin. How many kind of remember that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe some of you remember that uh, in the early 60s, in the Good Friday service, the petitions, there used to be a per, uh, petition against the Pervious, pervious Jews that they be converted to the true faith or something like that. He cut that out. You don't remember that, okay? I remember my grandmother always talking about the seven dollars, which was eliminated. The rosary of the seven dollars. Oh, okay. Uh, well, that's more on a devotional level and yeah. probably happened because uh, as a... Uh, Unfortunate consequence of Vatican II of the documents. What else? I, I think you just said it. Wasn't there part of the Passion or whatever that would always say, let his blood be upon us for, and our children? And he took that. And that, while that's still in our translation. Yeah, but they don't read it. Well, it, 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 maybe not in your church. <laughs> 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 result of the Second Vatican Council document on the liturgy. Yes, Dick. Bishop Wysislo attended the Vatican II, and my recollections were that we got fed some information through him back to our diocese. I worked with him for a period of time after Vatican II to develop a constitution for the parish council. And he had committees in Green Bay that worked on implementing some of the work. And the, so my memories are more uh, shaped by what he was telling us about the Pope and the country. But Bishop Wysislo came to this diocese in 1967, the last session of the Vatican Council was 63, okay. It was more uh, in our diocese, uh, the diocesan newspaper who had as their editor Father Orville Jansen. And I don't know if you, if you remember, but it used to be like 25 pages, our diocesan newspaper, and he kept up what was being uh, 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 done in the different committees. Uh, bishop Bona was our bishop during the time period of the council itself, and Bishop Grellinger as well. Okay, Bishop Grellinger was the auxiliary. Okay, one more, and then I'll get into. Are the newspapers available today? Uh, uh, only in archives. Okay, uh, and 
the, the formal change from Latin into English of the liturgy in this diocese was promulgated by Bishop Bona in the October 24th issue, 1964. <laughs> <laughs> of, of the diocese. And I remember that I remember that because some uh, just a few years ago, we uh, this parish celebrated its 50th anniversary, and someone went through their their uh, their back closets, and they had kept a copy of that. And right next to that was a huge announcement of a brand new school opening in <coughs> Appleton, which was this school. And there's three pages inside that mm -hmm. issue on St. Bernadette School and St. Bernadette Parish. And in the column right next to the front page was the formal decree by Bishop Bona that as of Advent of that year, the first Sunday of Advent, every parish in the diocese had to switch over to English in the liturgy. Okay? So, uh, but certainly when Bishop Bona did come on, he was uh, all gung-ho with all the changes in Second Vatican, uh, of the Second Vatican Council and uh, recruited uh, not only uh, some of the top priests in our diocese to head up, but uh, evidently some of our top lay people too to help them and implement that. So consider yourself, you know, one of the stars. Okay. Father, yeah. I'd like to know the name of that movie about. What was the name of that movie, Joy? I think it was just Pope John the Twenty Third. Pope John was, the Twenty Third. It was done at our church. One night we had Pope um, John the Twenty Third, and the next night we had Pope John Paul. Okay. It's yeah. Available through Saint Ignatius it Press. Right it's available through Saint Ignatius it's a Press. Three-hour movie. Okay. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, I, I'd like to share with you uh, some of the research I, I've uh, done, and, and uh, maybe some things that you know, and some things that you uh, didn't quite realize about him. As I said, uh, in his early life. Uh, he was the fourth of 14 children uh, and uh, of uh, a rather, rather poor family. Uh, uh, he received his early sacraments and in 1896 uh, went to the seminary he, and in the seminary he enrolled, was enrolled as a secular Franciscan, as a secular Franciscan, like third order. Uh, in 1904, he completed his doctorate in theology and was ordained a priest. Uh, and uh, shortly after that, uh, went to Rome and he actually met Pope Pius X, that he had a great deal of respect for. Um, uh, in 1905, then, he was uh, assigned to uh, parishes. Uh, there was a new bishop in Bergamo, the diocese he came from, and he became the secretary to the bishop, a post that he held for about nine years, almost ten years. Uh, and when, uh, two days after the death of Pope Pius X, there was rumblings, of course, of the outbreak of World War I, 19... 14, uh, the, his, the bishop's last words, Angelo, pray for peace. That, that really stuck, uh, you know, to him. During World War I then, even though he was a priest, he was drafted into the Roman, or the, not the Roman, the Royal Italian Army as a chaplain and stretcher bearer in the medical corps. Chaplain and stretcher bearer. He was discharged in uh, 1919 and named the spiritual director of the seminary. Uh, two years later, after meeting with Pope Benedict the 15th, Pope Benedict the 15th, 1921, he was appointed the Italian president of the Society for the Propagation of the Faith. Uh, 
And his recollection was Pope Benedict the Fifteenth was the most sympathetic or empathetic of all the popes he had ever met up to that time. Okay. Uh, 1925, um, the Cardinal Secretary of State at that time summoned him to, to the Vatican and said it was the new pope, Pope Pius XI's uh, decision to appoint him as apostolic vicar or visitor to Bulgaria. He didn't want to go. Bulgaria, 1925. Uh, but he relented under obedience uh, and then uh, uh, he, he was uh, shortly after that uh, given the Episcopal hat ordained a, a bishop uh, and took as his motto uh, obedience and peace note he did want to get into the diplomatic corps okay? that was foisted on him while he was in Bulgaria an earthquake struck the town uh, not far from where he was uh, and he, he wrote to his sisters that he wasn't affected by it except by the uh, devastation on the people. Nine years later, he was appointed apostolic delegate to Turkey and Greece and titular archbishop of a place in Bulgaria. Bulgaria. 1935, he used his office to help Jewish the Jewish underground save thousands of refugees in Europe. 1935. Uh, leading some to identify him as a righteous Gentile. Uh, more about that later. Uh, five years later, February 1939, he received news from his sisters that his mother was dying. Unfortunately for, for him in 1939, at the same time, the Pope was dying. And the Pope died. And there was a traditional period of mourning after a pope died of how many days? Nine days. During that time, his mother died. So he wasn't able to be there when his mother died because he had to stay in Rome for the traditional mourning period for the pope dying. Uh, that pope was replaced by Pope Pius XII. How many of you remember Pope Pius XII? Yeah. Not those young guys at that table. <laughs> so, Pope Pius XII. And Pope Pius XII, of course, was a pope for 19 years during the course of World War II. Huh? Uh, and uh, he listened to the coordination of the new pontiff, pontiff uh, while remaining in Bulgaria in his uh, diplomatic post during World War II. Uh, and he didn't think that the war was, uh, outbreak of World War II was going to affect Bulgar Bulgaria. So he was a better pastor than he was a prophet. Okay. In 1944, during the war, Pope Pius XII named him the Apostolic Nuncio. Okay, so this is a higher elevated post of, now he was in Turkey, Bulgaria, uh, Greece, of France. He's the Apostolic Nuncio of France. Yeah, yeah, go figure. You you think they keep them in the same region, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, what was the date on that, Father? Forty-four. Yeah, December forty-four. So, so almost was after 40. the invasion. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And one of his things that he had to do was negotiate the retirement of bishops who collaborated with the Germans. Oh. Oh. So he. he <laughs> Uh, learning diplomacy, uh, you know, being thrown into the fire. Uh, 
He must have been uh, pretty good at it. That's right. Yeah. So uh, Ron Colley was chosen to, as one of the candidates uh, to replace an archbishop uh, at a certain place, and uh, uh, one of the curial prelates uh, said, uh, "What, Ron Colley? That old fogey?" <laughs> At that time, he was 63 years old. <laughs> My age. <laughs> uh, however, he did have a young Monsignor in the Vatican that was a good friend of his, that he befriended and kind of mentored whose name was Giovanni Battista Montini. Montini. Uh, it, it ended up being that, yes. I asked Papal Nuncio then, someone brought up, uh, you know, in your recollection, uh, his efforts to help the Jews. Uh, as Nuncio, after World War II and after you know, the, 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 the ramifications of the Holocaust came up. Uh, his efforts, and there's a whole list here, uh, uh, of Jews in countries that he helped uh, to uh, save their lives. The Jewish refugees arriving in Insta Istanbul, he helped them get to Palestine. Slovenic children managed to leave the country due to his intervention. Jewish refugees uh, in Istanbul, uh, he uh, helped the main rabbi get a list of that together and pass it on so those uh, refugees could be uh, relocated to Palestine. Bulgarian Jews who left Bulgaria. Uh, as a result of his request uh, to the king. Romanian Jews uh, from Transnistria? Transnistria. Uh, they left Romania as a result of his intervention. Italian Jews, he helped also, uh, were given help by the Vatican through his intervention. Orphan children, maybe that's where. You found that on the movie Orphan Children from Trans, uh, Tran <coughs> Transnistria, uh, Romania. Uh, he helped uh, uh, afford a, a refugee ship for them uh, to be relocated to Palestine. Uh, Jews held in a Sirat uh, concentration camp were spared uh, because he intervened and help them get out of the camp. Mm -hmm. Hungarian Jews as well uh, were saved uh, by him. In 1967, the Catholic Herald uh, quoted John the 23rd, Pope John the 23rd, uh, as saying, now this was after his, his death, we are conscious today that many, many uh, centuries of blindness have cloaked our eyes so that we can no longer see the beauty of thy chosen people, nor recognize in their faces the few features of our privileged brethren. We realize that the mark of Cain stands upon our foreheads. Across the centuries, our brother Abel was lain in blood, which we drew or shed tears that we caused by forgetting your love. Forgive us for the curse we falsely attach to their name as Jews, forgive us for crucifying thee a second time in their flesh, for we know not what we did. John, uh, or uh, Paul, uh, uh, Pope John the Twenty Third. Yeah, pretty uh, powerful prayer, really. Uh, the Catholic Herald. Uh, in the year 2000, the International Raoul Wallenberg uh, Foundation, uh, it's, uh, they do extensive research and so on, on uh, those Gentiles that helped Jews and Jewish families during World War II, uh, 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 gave uh, 
a, a huge dossier, a massive file, to uh, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem called Yad Vashem. It's the it's the main, you know, memorial for for Jews outside of Jerusalem, uh, and, and those Gentiles who are honored by them are called are under the category of the righteous among the nations. He uh, was a part of that uh, in uh, <coughs> year 2000. Yes. Right after the <coughs> the Second World War, there was a group of Germans called Odessa who were secretly getting various Nazi hierarchy to uh, Argentina and Uruguay. And a number of them were priests, and he went after them. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a movie called The Odessa Files. Yeah. You can, I don't know if you ever saw that, or you can read it, yeah. Odessa Files, which is about that. But I don't know in that movie if it shows, you know, no. Ron Colley playing any kind of a part. But, but there were great. priests that were giving false documents to these Germans, and he put it, he went after it, really put it into it. Yeah. Okay, Dick? 1958 was when Israel was formed. 48. 48. 48. 48. Ten years before. 48. Yeah. Uh. Well, my point is that there was a major exodus from Europe that other people that I know were involved in. And I think this Pope was very instrumental in getting more of the Jewish people from Bulgaria and Romania, that Eastern European group, yeah. and some French Jews. Right. So, but he wasn't Pope yet. He, he was, helped in getting them to Israel. The new he, he did it as the Apostolic Nuncio of yes, France. When he was there in France. Yeah. yeah. So, now, uh, when uh, Pope Pius the Twelfth died. Uh, after 19 years, uh, it, when they came to the conclave, um, he uh, he was a cardinal by then, and uh, he was in his 70s. He was uh, elected as a, a stopgap pope. You know, just a kind of a carryover. Why? Because uh, uh, Monsignor uh, Giovanni Battista Montini was, was highly regarded in the Vatican and in Vatican circles. Uh, however, he wasn't a cardinal. However, on the other hand, according to the Code of Canon Law at that time, even someone who wasn't a cardinal could ostensibly be elected as Pope. But Montini wasn't even an archbishop or a bishop. He was a monsignor. So uh, they, uh, you know, he was kind of ruled out, and they said, "Well, let's let's elect this old fogey." Uh, so he was uh, elected, and of course they they asked him the the question, traditional questions: "What what is your name going to be?" And he said, "I'll be called John." First time in 500 years that someone took, the Pope took the name John, and uh, and what number? And he's, well, first of all, so they asked him why. And he said, my father was John. He was dear to me. The humble parish I grew up in was St. John's that I was baptized in. Uh, it's a solemn name for a number of cathedrals, uh, including our own basilica in Rome, St. John Lateran, okay. Uh, there's 22, there's been 22 Johns of indisputable legacy uh, in the church, all with brief pontificates. So he realized that at the age of 76 that they elected him because he was, you know, probably going to die soon anyhow. That's why, it's, but someone objected. But what number are you going to take? And he said 23rd. And they said, hold it, hold it. There, there was an anti-pope during the Great Western Schism 
uh, Pope John the Twenty Third. Uh, Pope <laughs> that Pope John the Twenty Third. Uh, uh, you know that was during the time period when there was two and three popes. Okay, in the church, uh, he was there from fourteen ten to fourteen fourteen. Uh, that Pope John the Twenty Third actually called the Council of Pisa to unify the. Popes, but it ended up the, they elected their own popes, so we had three popes at the same time. And then uh, the, the John the Twenty Third actually you know, called the Council of Constance and and abdicated, you know, from Avignon. And then Pope Martin the Fifth took over. Uh, but you know the, this the, that Pope John the Twenty Third, he's called an anti-pope because he wasn't one of the legitimate. Popes in the line of Peter, uh, although Pope Martin V asked him to be a cardinal and send him to a parish. You know. but what's interesting about that Pope John the Twenty Third also was uh, he started out his life as a pirate, <laughs> and, and the reason the reason why in 1410 the cardinals at Avignon asked him to be pope because the Roman states were being threatened by this nefarious person called Ladislaus, Ladislaus, and they thought that this pope, with his military background, <laughs> could negotiate uh, around that. Yeah. No, no, they don't just no, they don't just pick a number. It's it's in line with the, how many have had that name before. Okay, so and and he he did choose that name in order also to show that that pope was not in the legitimate line of succession. Yes, faith. So what was the first miracle? I'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> You're only concerned about the miracles. I'm giving you the whole context here. You know, I'm a contextualist, whether it's a Bible context or, you know, historical context. Yes. Uh, another interesting thing I think about Pope, uh, the old John the 23rd, is his detractors accused him of being a herb. Yes, but it wasn't. It wasn't that. It no, wasn't it, a fact, but they it, they wanted something against him. Remember it was these three people that were contesting for the papacy. They wanted to find something against the other person. And that's what they said. There was uh, a mistaken identity in the 11th century of a pope, John which was a misspelling in Latin of John, okay? And there's a whole mythological story that surrounds that. But it was not the John, it, it wasn't the John the 23rd from the 15th century, it was the 11th century, okay? Uh, all right, so when he was elected Pope uh, and uh, had his coronation, uh, coronation, uh, on the Feast of St. Charles Borromeo, November 4th, 1958. Uh, and, you know, the, the coronation at that time lasted like five hours, and, you know, uh, and even th at the end uh, of that long, long day and, and so on, people outside in the plaza, you know, were calling out to him and so on. And, and he went out to the plaza and uh, went out to the balcony and and told them to uh, go home and you know hug their hug their children for the pope. Give their children a, a hug for the pope because they're there so long, you know. Uh, uh, so he was elected in November, uh, December twenty uh, fifth. He was the first pope since eighteen seventy to make a pastoral visit in the diocese of Rome. Otherwise, the popes just stayed in the Vatican. He visited a children's hospital on Christmas Day in 1958. And then uh, shortly after, the next day, he went to the uh, uh, Rome's
prison, visited prisoners. He said, you couldn't come to me, so I came to you. Uh, and this created quite a sensation. And uh, he, with that uh, statement, he said, you couldn't come to me, I came to you, signal a shift too. He's the first pope in many, many years not to use the royal we, but said I and me. Okay? Then he started a little practice that I think our Pope Francis does. He kept sneaking out of the Vatican at night, <laughs> taking walks through the streets, driving the Swiss Guard nuts. So much so that the Vatican, uh, the the Italian press gave him a nickname, Johnny Walker. <laughs> Good research, huh? Yes. Uh, okay, so, uh, all right, I, I told you about the Jews, and, and uh, we, we mentioned, you know, his change in the Good Friday liturgy and so on. Calling the council then, he, this uh, it was absolutely amazing when he made the uh, announcement. Uh, he was calling uh, the first uh, uh, council, uh, well, it's the, it was Vatican II because there was a first Vatican Council in 1870, okay? Uh, and actually his good buddy, uh, by that time, Cardinal Giovanni uh, Montini, uh, made a remark that uh, this old boy doesn't realize what a hornet's nest he's going to be stirring up. <laughs> Montini said that. So uh, they had the first session. Before starting the first session of... Uh, Vatican II, he made a visit both to Assisi, remember, way back as a seminarian, he became, a, no, third order of Franciscan, second, okay, and he made a, a visit to Loreto, uh, invoking the Blessed Virgin to, to be over them. Uh, uh, just before the start of the council, uh, uh, he expressed, uh, he wrote two major encyclicals. And one, just before I started the council, was Mater et Magistra. His second major work, which was completed two months before he died, was Pacem in Terrace. Terra. Terra or Terra? Okay. The Mater et Magistra actually shows his uh, uh, conviction. It dealt with uh, all kinds of moral issues, including a prohibitive view on contraceptives and a, a concept of uh, uh, family. And he spoke about family and the, the warned against divorce. Pachamenteras, of course, was a, his advocacy for human rights in the modern world, for the unborn, the uh, uh, needy, and so on. And some, uh, and I, you know, uh, as a college student, I remember having to read it and study it and, and so on. Uh, he indicated, you know, so, some of the threats to okay. human society, uh, indicating... Uh, birth control, but really, he outlined in there, it was, it's an excellent summary of basic international human rights for all people, right, to food, and clothing, and, and uh, medical care, and uh, it, there, it really is a wonderful, succinct summary, and a, a seminal, he, he kind of summed up the key points of other uh, social justice and cyclicals in Pacham and Terrace. And he, he also sent out a warning against nu nuclear proli proliferation. 1959. Uh, uh, and 1961 it came out. He wrote it in 59. Uh, all right. 
Uh, he cut down, uh, uh, reformed the, uh, the coronation of popes and so on. The first session of the Second Vatican Council, of, of course, happened in October 1962. I, I recall uh, the nuns getting all excited, uh, teaching us in, in grade school and having to, you know, follow that. Uh, over 2,500 bishops from all over the world came. Uh, our bishop at that time in the Diocese of Green Bay was Bishop Bona. Uh, he went. Uh, just recently, where was it? Maybe in this compass. There's a picture, I think, in this week's uh, diocesan paper of Bishop Bona with those who were our diocesan seminarians at that time studying in Rome. Uh, a lot of these priests are dead but some are still alive and they're, they're uh, Father David Kiefer of recent memory was a seminarian at that time Father Joe Matern from Manasha was a seminarian at that time Father John uh, Father John the Wayne now Monsignor he's still percolating around here uh, uh, Gillis what is uh, no Ralph Gillis, I think. Mike, I'm looking to you to help me. Uh, Ralph Gillis. Yeah, I think was a seminary, and I think there was, I think there was five. I think there was one more picture. Was, was, Schomer? No. No. No, Schomer was in the service. Yeah. Question. Uh, under Pope John XXIII, was that the time that the nuns no longer had to wear the wimble? I remember that there were a lot of reforms, and my great aunt was the Reverend Mother of Holy Family Convent. And it was the first time I knew what my great aunt really looked like. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, that's the way some of those religious communities interpreted the reforms. Yeah. They did not say that, but that's the way some. Orders interpreted, and so there was an exodus after that. Um, uh, so he, he, he uh, you know, started the council. He was very concerned. Uh, they had these bishops, and uh, did you ever hear the term of Perini? They invited Pariti. Pariti were non-bishop theologians, scholars from around the world that the bishops uh, recommended would come to the council and help the bishops formulate the agendas and write the text for what became the documents of the Second Vatican Council. Okay, uh, a young a young Polish professor was sent by his cardinal, Carol Witiwa, to be a Paridi. Uh, uh, in, in earlier sessions, in later sessions, he, he became a bishop, and he was there as a bishop. Uh, Carol Witiwa. And here's the interesting thing. All these bishops from all these countries around the world, and, and they used St. Peter's Basilica. They set up bleachers and boxes and so on. They listed them alphabetically to mix them all up so that they wouldn't stay in their little, you know, you know, uh, you know, uh, their own little national groups and so on. Okay. So later on, Bishop Wysislo from by that time. Uh, he, wa he was a bishop, not in, in our diocese, but in Chicago, sat right next to this young Polish bishop, Watiwa. Okay, they're next to one another. Uh, I mentioned Pariti, one of my, uh, one of my professors uh, that I had in graduate school, a Benedictine monk, Father Gottfried Dietmund, was invited as a Pariti. Uh, I also had Father Killian McDonald, 
a Benedictine professor that I had uh, was also a priest. But but Father um, Godfrey Diekman was invited for as an expert in liturgy and in the fathers of the church. And Father Godfrey told us uh, in one of their their meetings uh, with the bishops, they were working, and and Bishop or Pope John the Twenty Third came in, and he said to them, "What are you working on today?" And they said, "We're looking at uh, the revision of the Liturgy of the Hours." You know, into from Latin to English and revising. Oh, he said, "Wonderful, wonderful." He said, "You know, I I have always said all the hours of the church." And been faithful to the bravery every single day of my priesthood, and I always get them all done before eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> now the thing is, there's supposed to be morning prayer, mid-morning prayer, <laughs> noon prayer, three o'clock prayer, evening prayer, and night prayer is supposed to be spread out. And, he, and the Pope said he, he said them all. <laughs> he got them all in, you know, uh, before eight o'clock in the morning. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, after the, after the first session of the council, uh, shortly after that, he was diagnosed with a family tradition that killed off at least one of his sisters and his mother, stomach cancer. He had stomach cancer. Uh, and uh, that afflicted him and brought him down so that uh, uh, he, uh, by, uh, before the next year was over, he uh, succumbed to that illness. Uh, when, he, when he had... Uh, died, the official thing was peritonitis, because his stomach had, uh, the cancer had, had, you know, infected his other organs and so on. And so that was very sad, uh, and a lot of the uh, uh, professors uh, or uh, professional people that, uh, and world leaders, including uh, uh, Kennedy, uh, well, Kennedy was gone by then, but Lyndon Johnson uh, had the great praise for him. He's known as the, the good pope. Uh, uh, Faye, to answer your question, uh, he was declared blessed in the year 2000, along with Pope Pius IX. He was declared blessed by Pope John Paul II, uh, being just one step away for a miracle cure, curing an ill woman. Okay. Uh, when he was declared blessed, they decided to move his body, and this was in the year 2000. He died in 63. When they uh, reviewed his body, it was in perfect condition. And the Vatican said it's because of the great embalming techniques that we, you know, used uh, are using. Uh, and then on the 50th anniversary of his death, just last year in 2013, Pope Francis uh, visited his tomb and and uh, prayed by it, and uh, decided at that time. <coughs> to join in the canonization of John Paul II and John the 23rd, even though there wasn't a second miracle attributed to John the 23rd since his beatification. However, Francis based his decision on, answer your question, Roy, based it on the merits of the Second Vatican Council, that it, it, it was a, a miracle to the church. Now, one last thing about uh, a writing. Uh, almost all his life since he was a seminarian, he kept a journal. That was published shortly after he died. It's entitled The Journal of a Soul. <laughs> journal of a Soul. Just last night at St. Pius X, there was... Uh, uh, 
the bishop was there and over 25 priests and a whole bunch of deacons, the establishment of a new religious community of women in our diocese, the missionaries of the word. And after the ceremony, I talked with, uh, there was a, a mother, a, a woman who was raised to being the mother of the order. She wrote up the constitution and so on. Uh, she will be called, she was known as Peggy Dumley. She will be called, uh, known as Mother Mary Catherine from now on. And two postulants who've been with her for about a year and a half. Both uh, they were invested with the habit. They're going to be habit-wearing nuns, okay, missionaries of the word. There is a, uh, another young lady who, who sang as a part of that, uh, who was with the Spiritus Retreat team. I knew I went and talked to her, and I said, Aaron, you know, I thought you were, you know, connected with you. I thought you were going to be a postulant. And she said, I've only been with them for seven months. I, I, I'm like a, a baby postulant. You know, I have to be for another uh, year and a half. But she, she said that for spiritual reading, she's reading the Journal of the Soul of John the 23rd. To connect with this, uh, one of the newest things. Was Aaron about the Yes, Aaron was about so thank you very much. I hope this is helpful. Next week we're going to look, I'm going to have a closer look of John Paul II.